Welcome back, beautiful listeners, to season two of Stadio Speaks. We are back with even more insightful and captivating episodes this season. I'm your host, Kanisa, and today we have a very, very special guest with us, the CEO of Stadio Higher Education, Chris Foster. Get ready for an intimate conversation as we dive into Chris's childhood, his journey through education, and his unique story that led him to harm one of the leading institutions in South Africa. Hi Chris, and thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to grace us with your presence today. Um, What made you take on the challenge of being a CEO for a new institution? So can you say, this is actually very interesting. Um, uh, As you know, I was the CEO of Southern Business School, Mm -hmm. and then the opportunity came along to be part of Stadio. Um, Stadio acquired the different brands and so Stadio also acquired Southern Business School. My initial thinking was that after the acquisition I will go and sit on the stoop for a while Mm -hmm. and think what I want to do going forward and then uh, the board approached me and asked me to be part of the Stadio management which I then agreed to and uh, for me the main reason why I got involved is I saw this incredible opportunity that presented itself for us as a a new institution to really make a significant contribution to the country Mm. and that was also the main reason why I sold Southern Business School to start you Mm. was to be part of something that has a big impact, you know, that can really make a difference in the country. Mm. So uh, in a long answer to that question, yes, it is. The reason was to really make a significant impact in the South African uh, landscape. And how did you become CEO if they invited you to be part of the board first? So uh, what happened behind the scenes, I mean, there was a process and obviously the board had to uh, make their selection. Mm so yes, I think uh, I went through the interviews, there was a process and uh, they decided on, on me. Um, and then tell me what motivates you um, every day to come in and do the work that you do? I must say um, that was something that I promised myself that as soon as I wake up in the morning and I don't feel that passion anymore, it, it is time for me then to call it quits. So I can say that unequivocally, every morning I wake up, I'm enthusiastic and very excited to go to work because I really believe in what Stadio is doing at the moment. And I'm super excited on uh, what we are building here and where this institution is going. So tell me what your leadership style is and how does it play a role in your decision making? I think my leadership style is very much people focus Um, for our industry and our business I mean that is what we work with we work with people we work with people that take emotional decisions on looking at why they come to an uh, academic institution Mm -hmm. and you also work with staff members that is emotionally connected to the institution Mm -hmm. because let's be honest The majority of our staff are not here because of the big money that they're going to earn. Mm. They are here to really make a difference. Mm. So as a leader of such a type of institution or or business, you must understand that both the staff and the students have a very emotional connotation to your product. Mm. And I would say for me, um, my leadership style is very much people focused. Um, How do you define your philosophy in life? Um, I would say pragmatic. Uh, I I do a lot of planning, uh, looking especially in the financial side of the business and in my personal life and where I want to be at Mm. certain stages in my life. But over the years, I've also learned, especially in my personal life, to, to have a more relaxed approach. Mm. to life and to with my engagement uh, with people in my life so 
not always try to plan everything for the next three to five years, but mm. to more go with the flow. To be able to roll with the punches. Correct. <laughs> okay, great. And considering we live in such a fast changing world, what in your opinion are the key factors contributing to success in the, edu in the educational space? So yes, it is a fast changing world. We've seen a lot of things happening, especially in the education space. I think one of the biggest disruptors must be AI and mm -hmm. how that is being used in the education world. But if you really just look up and take a, a view from the outside in and you look at education in totality, things or the, the core things in education remains the same. Mm -hmm. So what do I mean by that? Quality offering, making sure that your programs are programs of quality, mm -hmm. that it is industry linked and that there is value being added to your students after obtaining the qualifications. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that will never change. Mm -hmm. um, to adapt with the changes, I see that as part of our everyday life. We have to adapt. But there are certain key aspects in education that, that will never change. And mm. that is quality, value adding, really equipping your, your students with the necessary skills to make a success with their lives. Mm. Um, tell me what you think sets Stadio apart from other institutions. So the Stadio story, can you say, is is something we're very proud of and um, we use the slogan uh, start you a new vision in higher education mm -hmm. so the, the, this is going to be quite a lengthy answer to, to that question we because have I all want, of the time don't worry because <laughs> I want to get the message across yes. so what makes us different the strategy is clear we want to create a community I call it the Stardew community. And in that community, we want to serve all the community members because all those community members have a direct connection with Stardew. So who are these community members? It's firstly your staff, it's your students, and then as a listed entity, it is your shareholders and all other relevant parties. So for me, we are all connected and involved in the institution and we want to make sure that we get all three of these parties to have that special connection and to benefit from the institution. Mm -hmm. So I still stand to be corrected. We're the only institution in the world that offers our postgraduate students shares in the institution. Mm. So they become co-owners and shareholders of the institution after obtaining their postgraduate degrees. So there we see that total buying and um, I cement the whole thing of uh, community engagement or, or community um, belonging. Uh, and then we also have a staff share scheme again uh, where staff will also then share in the upside of the institution and then obviously you get your shareholders. So in this community we all then share in promoting and building a sustainable institution. Mm. And so it's not just the relationship between the institution and the student, it goes wider mm. than the institution, the staff, as well as the shareholders mm. all become part of this community. And, and that's what we want to get right at Stadio, mm. is, is to build this community that will feed off one another. Mm. Beautiful. One of our biggest challenges in, in private higher education is to build a strong alumni. Mm. Uh, if we look at our public competition, uh, a lot of us all come from public universities and a lot of us are still part of those alumni mm. uh, from the institutions where you studied. That nut we haven't cracked yet in the contact uh, in the in private, private space. So I believe with this whole community that we want to establish, we're going to see very nice long-term 
uh, traction on creating a Stardew alumni over the years. Mm. Tell me how um, Stardew accommodates the needs and expectations of students who are looking for a more personalised and flexible learning experience. So yes, that is something that management is is focusing on and, and trying to get right as we understand the needs of students changes over time. Mm. So at Stardew we've we took the route of offering both modes of delivery where we have a contact learning where you will typically have an on-campus experience. Uh, we have seven campuses across the country where students can uh, enroll and, and do their contact learning uh, mode of delivery and then we also offer the distance learning mode of delivery. So mm -hmm. why the two modes? Um, Stardew stands for widening access and we believe by offering both modes you can really live up to that vision of widening access. Mm -hmm. Why do I say that? Um, it is a fact that contact learning is more expensive Yes. due to the overheads and the physical bricks and mortar that you have to carry. But uh, in the distance learning space, due to the technology that we can use and uh, having students from anywhere in the country, it makes it possible to offer that mode of delivery at lower price points. Mm. Um, so there, both students uh, can enroll for any one of Stardew's uh, programs, whether you can afford the contact learning space or mm. if you can't, there is still the option to do the distance learning space. Mm. Also to where you find yourself in your life, you know, you, you're employed, you have the opportunity to get promotion, but to get that promotion, you need to up your qualifications and mm. your skill sets. And there again, the distance learning mode gives you that freedom to study at your own pace um, and getting that qualification that is needed mm. to get the, the promotion that you want. We also look at our curriculum and how we design the curriculum so that we give students the option both in both modes to give them more electives, you know, to really talk to their interest in, in the program that they would select. Mm. So that you, you are not limited to only one or two modules, you have a choice of modules mm. to really speak to the students and try to accommodate their interest in the different qualifications. I guess it also gives them flexibility to like manage their schedules. Like let's say if you're a mom and you're working, now you're able to like accommodate two to three modules instead of having like a full semester of like seven modules. Absolutely, and uh, I think uh, Stardew is, is doing that right. If we mm. look at our student numbers, it is still 80% of our business is where we have these adult learners, mm. where uh, they balance the, the adulthood, being employed, being a, a parent, as well as getting your, your degree. Mm. Um, so yeah, most definitely, I think we we are doing well in that regard. Um, what are some of your fondest um, passions that you've initiated within the institution? So for me to um, amalgamate or uh, successfully complete the migration of the different brands into one stardew was a, was a big achievement. Um, I don't think we've done it without hiccups. I don't think we've um, completed the process but we've come a long way over the last two years. Mm. And I think we've really put down something that we can all feel very proud of. Mm. To take four institutions with their own histories, their own processes, their own way of doing things for many years mm. into one new uh, setup and environment where everything has changed is, is quite a daunting task. And I think we've done very well. So. That is without a doubt the one that I would, I would say is on, on top of the list. Mm -hmm. And then um, another very fond mem memory was to overcome all the obstacles to put the staff share scheme in place. Mm. Um, which was a daunting task when we started with it 
um, is something that will also be um, close to my heart forever. Mm. To be able to do that and then thirdly the, the staff she is keeping. And I'm sure you oh, must feel so, sorry. it must be so rewarding to be able to like tick off on your list what you're able to do and to like see it through at the end. Yes, it, it is really rewarding and I think that's why I, I've said earlier um, that drives me every day, you know, to, to wake up and to have those lists that I still want to tick off yes. um, is what drives you. Mm. And it also speaks to the leadership um, skills that you asked me about where I said it's people focused. So that's yeah. what really excites me because those all three of those things that we've just um, discussed of what what drives the passion mm. are all actually people orientated. So, yes, it is. Yes. Um, what's your vision for Staria Higher Education in the next 10 years? Sure, this is um, very exciting for me. I think uh, uh, the sky is literally the limit, the limit. yeah. We, um, we are building a fantastic institution without a doubt. The wheels of higher education turns very slowly. So a lot of things that we've already implemented uh, in the institution will only reap the benefits in the years to come. Mm. You know, for example, if we look at all the new exciting programs that we've developed and that's in the pipeline, when you introduce a new program, you start off very, very small. So I think the CHE and the regulator also limits us with a new program. You're only allowed mm. to, let's say, open a program with 20 students. Mm. So you run the full year with only 20 students, but at the same time, you carry the whole infrastructure of in that year program. for that mm. new program. So it's only in year three, four, where you have a nice cohort that you really, from a business perspective, start to see the benefits of that, that new program. Mm. And just by using this one example, you know, we have so many new programs lined up mm. where we would see great uptick going forward mm. in the business. So that's very exciting. I think we have branded the institution very well in this short period of time. Um, the feedback that we get from the market is that there's a very good a trust towards the parent from our students and the broader public mm. and that also then you know fits well to what we anticipate will happen going forward. Mm. Industry is really embracing and, and working together with Stardew. Um, we are starting with our internationalization and we see very good response from universities across the world where they want to partner with Stardew. So I think, yes, we've laid a very, very solid foundation for this institution just to go from strength to strength. Mm. I've um, made no secret about it. I see Stardew as a real alternative to the bigger public uh, institutions in the country and that's where we should play our role. We want to make a significant contribution to education in the country. Mm. And yes, we want to grow. We want to be one of the biggest higher education institutions in the country that will offer quality education and would really change things in this country and will improve people's lives. Mm. Any new schools the public can look forward to? New schools, yes. Um, we've just started with engineering. Exciting. Yeah, very exciting. I think from a strategic point of view, mm. um, it's very good for the institution. We are then looking at other possible schools still to come. Things like agriculture. Mm, that's a um, good one. Yes, which, which is exciting. We look um, starting to investigate not a medical school, but more at possible other qualifications in, in that sector, mm. um, as well as um, humanities. We definitely want to expand. We only started this year, or last year, sorry, um, 
we've started with our school of humanities, very mm. small with one qualification, so mm -hmm. there's still a lot of scope. And then there's a big focus on our school of IT, information technology. So that is we really the want future. to <laughs> establish that school as yes. one of our flagships going forward. So Very a lot exciting. of effort and focus is coming in that school as well. Very exciting. Very exciting. Okay, and then um, now that we're all shareholders, as you mentioned, thanks to you. Um, can you give us any insight of what lies ahead for Stadio Holdings? Yes, for, for Holdings, we are starting to become a more mature uh, a company, listed entity. Um, a lot of our focus for the last few years was the consolidation and then to go into a very aggressive growth um, period. So growth is definitely on the top of the agenda for another few years. We're mm. far from maturity. Mm. As I've just indicated, we've got so much more new programs coming in. Yes. There's a lot of new schools that we're going to open. There is uh, a lot of opportunity for second income streams. Mm. So there's a lot of things still in the developmental phase for the holdings entity. Mm. We have the other two brands also in our group being AFTA, which is a more matured institution. But the growth there will typically come from opening up more uh, campuses for the AFTA brand as its only contact learning. Mm. And then very exciting in the holdings group also is, is um, the Mill Park brand where we are establishing ourselves as a leader in online learning, especially in the finance and uh, banking sector. Exciting. So, um, yes, from a holdings perspective, look at growth, aggressive, and then also starting to be more aggressive in the return of, um, uh, to, to show our shareholders, give our shareholders higher returns on their investments. So looking at increasing dividends to shareholders mm. over the next few years. Um, share with us what advice you would give um, for aspiring entrepreneurs or future leaders. Yeah, what is the saying? Um, you need to be tough to do business in South Africa. I think it's a challenging <laughs> environment um, where, where we get challenged with things that other people in the rest of the world don't, don't really have to deal with. This is like ESCOM and load shedding. Yes, we can know them <laughs> Story all. Story of our lives. But my focus is always not to, not to let those things that's out of your control mm -hmm. really uh, dictate where you can go with your business and with mm. your ideas. Love that. So believe in what you want to do. And then it's perseverance. Mm. So um, if I think back in my journey, um, the first few years was very tough. Mm. There were times that I really wondered whether I'm, I can crack this nut. You have a lot of self-doubt. Mm. But persevere, if you really believe in what you do and you persevere, the success will come. Mm. And build your whole business as an entrepreneur as well. Build it with people. You cannot do it on your own. Yeah. And you need your people to all share the vision and to all pull in the same direction. Mm. And then the successes will come. Okay, last one before we get into our tick this or that game. <laughs> um, are there any lessons from your own journey that you believe would be very valuable for young professions and entrepreneurs? Yeah, I think, um, again, looking back at my journey, it's it's the uncertainty some, sometimes where you have a bit of self-doubt, mm. uh, especially in those starting years, um, whether you're doing the right thing, the fear of what if, what if um, this and that is going to happen, mm. is, to, is to really trust in yourself, you know, and the, that, that's the biggest thing. That, that, that was in my journey 
the thing that I think I had to overcome mm. and just believe, but you can do this. Yeah. Um, because it's a lonely thing to be an entrepreneur. Mm. Uh, there's nobody that's going to come and save you. Uh, many times you sit on your own and, and, and you have to really think this thing through and whether you're doing the right thing. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's that perseverance and self-belief I think is of utmost importance. So this season of the podcast, we've introduced a new segment called This and That. It's quick questions that will basically give you an option to choose between this answer or that answer. So are you ready? It's going to be quick. So you know you don't have time to think. It's literally okay. the first thought that comes into your mind. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay, cool. So wine or brandy? Wine. Uh, stormers or bulls? Oh, stormers. That's the easy one. <laughs> <laughs> Breakfast or dinner? Breakfast. Mercedes or BMW? Uh, BMW. Motorbike or car? Motorbike. Cape Town or Gauteng? Cape Town. <laughs> I knew it. Bush or beach? Uh, beach. Um, Boltong or Dorvos? Boltong. Um, Bry or Dine? Uh, Bry. Rugby World Cup or Cricket World Cup? Uh, rugby World Cup. Reading or listening to podcasts? Podcast. Night Owl or Early Bird? Early Bird. Entrepreneur or corporate employee? Sure, entrepreneur. I concludes with this or that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> when you look back at your childhood, what's one memory that stood out to you? Sure, there are many memories. I had a very, very um, enjoyable uh, childhood. Um, I think the time that we've actually lived in Hartebees mm -hmm. was something that will stay with me forever. Uh, just the freedom as uh, what I experienced there as a young boy mm. living in Hartis was something that I really cherished and it was um, very enjoyable for me. Um, when you look back at your childhood, do you think uh, your parents were strict? Yeah, I would say um, maybe because I was the youngest of the two children, um, I got away with a, f a few more things than I think my older sister did. Mm. Um, so I don't, I don't think I had very strict parents though, no. But you know, at the same time, I was such a uh, who do you say in Afrikaans? We'll say Sukkent, you know. Uh, there was no <laughs> no issues with Chris, you know. Mm. So yeah. I, I didn't have all that strict parents. Um, mm. uh, that's not something that that sticks with me that they were strict. No. Okay. I had uh, very good memories with my sister. We were quite close uh, growing up together. Um, as a typical older sister, she I think she also thought that she was uh, my second mum. Of course. So yeah, so um, it was my mission to try and make it difficult for her as well <laughs> and uh, that created a lot of fun in the house for me over the yes. years. It wasn't so funny for her and uh, luckily my parents could see the, the fun side in it, um, mm. really making it tough for my sister to take this second mum role in the, in the house. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. And uh, do you have a song that reminds you of your childhood? Nothing comes to mind immediately. Mm -hmm. um, I actually love music. I listen to a lot of music, but something that I will, a connectation with my childhood, mm -hmm. Maybe Glory Days from Bruce Springsteen. Yeah, I, d I don't know. No, I, <laughs> What's the memory on Glory get, Days? <laughs> I, I just have to, to say that, you know, I had very enjoyable childhood, mm. a very happy child, um, growing up in a very protected environment, mm. in a family that um, we didn't, we were a very moderate family. I would say a, a middle class to a lower, lower middle class, mm. um, but with a lot of love and a very close family. So mm. yeah, it's, it's all good memories. That's um, lovely. Connected with a song, I must, I must think about that. <laughs> That's not a problem. Um, what was something you were very afraid of as a child? Not making the A rugby side, I would think. You know, <laughs> rugby was so important <laughs> for me. I, I could just think, yes, if I don't make the school rugby side, that would have been the end of my world. <laughs> um, Did you make it? Did you yeah, make the A team? I must, I must uh, say that I am um, very blessed. I um, actually had a very good schoolboy rugby career. 
mm -hmm. always in the A side. 99% of the years I was the first team captain or the A side captain that I played in. So yeah, that was basically a very important part of my life. <laughs> so if they dropped me from the A team, I think that would have been a very um, stressful experience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did you go on to play rugby in university? Yes, I did. I, um, I played Craven Week at high school, which was the, the goal mm. that I wanted to achieve. And then after I played uh, the under age groups, under 19, under 20, under 21 for the Lions uh, up there in Gauteng. Mm. And uh, I also had the honor to play for the Lions uh, or the South African, uh, what do they call us? They called us, it wasn't the SA under 20s, it was the South African Young Invitation Team playing mm. against the English Bulldogs. Ah. So these were all in the apartheid years while we were still uh, banned out of South, or international rugby. Mm. So we couldn't call ourselves uh, a South African team mm. and the English couldn't call themselves the official English team. So it was the South African young team playing against the English Bulldogs. Um, That's so which was a fond, fond memory. Yeah, nice. Um, do you, have in, do you have a revolutionary experience that has shaped your life? I think um, starting Southern Business School and um, really at that stage, uh, I took on the only real well-known distance learning institution being UNISA. Mm. And then to start at such a small scale, taking on this giant, where mm. everybody said to me, this, this concept of distance learning, and remember now this was in 1994, mm. was never going to be successful. Mm. Um, and that has taught me a lot about myself, because I wanted to make a success of it. I put all my belongings, all my resources into it. Mm. So. It was very stressful because I've put a lot of pressure on my family and my extended family mm. on um, having everything that I have invested into this and then having to make it work. Mm. Um, I think shaped me for the rest of my life mm. because it was that perseverance. It's not an option to say it can't work. Yeah, And that's what I also try to to teach my children, you know, if you take a decision, this is what you want to do in life, this is the passion that you have, mm. is to persevere and don't opt out uh, when things start to get tough. Mm. You, you need to work through it and um, if you focus on the right things, the success will come. Beautiful, I love that. Um, tell me what you would give, um, what advice you would give your 30 year old self? Sure. <laughs> Stop worrying about the future and enjoy <laughs> the 30s um, more. Uh, but again, you know, I ask myself this type of question often. Uh, what, would have, what would you have changed if you can do it over again? Yeah. And um, I think up to now, I'm still very young, but I had a very full life up to where I am now. Mm. I really did things. I mm. always tried to have a balance. I forced myself not just to focus on just work, but to have a good balance. And I've, mm. I've done quite a, while, a lot of things. I've traveled um, extensively. I've done a few things in my life. Um, I, work, I, had, I met great people. I had great times with people mm. in, in this journey. So yeah, I, there's nothing that I regret. Let me say that, mm. um, but it's important to live in the moment as well and yeah. not, or not to worry too much about, about the, the future. future. Mm. If you do things right where you are, the future will also fall in place. Beautiful. Okay, last question. What is great about your life right now? I have a lot of things to be grateful of. Um, being part of Stadio is, is one of it. Mm -hmm. Um, as I say, I'm so excited on what we are doing here at Stadio 
and I really believe so much in our vision and mm. the impact that we're going to have in this country it's it's going to be something to be very very proud of mm. I'm very proud of my my family and my children um, yeah it's something that's very close to my heart mm. um, and then to be a South African you know mm. it's a tough time for us all here in, in, in the southern tip of Africa mm. but um, I've seen it every year, you know, this year I went to France for the World Cup and we're just a special bunch of people. Mm. And uh, every time you sit there in the stadium with your green jersey on and we see South Africans from all walk of life coming together, mm. it, it just makes you very, very proud to be part of South Africa and mm. to be a South African. Amazing. A heartfelt thank you to Chris Foster for gracing us with his presence and sharing his incredible journey. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. As we wind up this episode of Stadio Speaks, we hope you've gained valuable insights into the world of education and leadership. Until next time, stay curious, stay inspired, and keep learning. This is Kanisa signing off for Stadio Speaks.